right. Welcome everybody to this week's Eat and Greet. And we have got the most magical Stephen Forrest here with us this week. And I was so excited that he said yes. And it is proof too, that if you just ask, someone may say Yes, get out of your comfort zone and ask. And that's what we're doing a lot with the eat and greets is asking questions, learning new topics, new ideas, and just jumping in and having some grace with each other. So Stephen, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Stormy. Yes, and all it took was a little email stalking, friends. So uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> put that in. Fourth two or three times. <laughs> yes, yes. But it, you know, I think the most amazing thing was the, the timing of when things are supposed to happen. I genuinely believe that they line up. And I thought about reaching out to you. And very quickly, I mean, days later, Norwalk came up and then that happened. And it just was a very easy flow to, to connect. So I'm pretty grateful for technology today. <laughs> so today we are going to talk about a subject you guys have been asking about, and we're going to talk about the different phases of the moon and when you were born under different phases of the moon and what it looks like as you progress through those phases as well. And this is a neat technique that if you've ever sat with me or if you've read the books by Stephen talking about the phases, this just, it illuminates this other piece of the personality, this, this place of a quiet internal set of magic that we move under and are kind of guided with that it's just nuance. Astrology is a beautiful set of nuance, I believe. And this adds this other delicious little layer in there. So we're going to jump into that today. And Stephen, how did, I mean, you've been doing this so much longer than I have and in my eyes have perfected this thing. So how did you come to this or what, how did this become a part of your practice? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me. I get on a roll because I get excited <laughs> about this stuff before I know it. An hour might have gone by. Um, I, I, for, for one, one kind of interesting starting point is that, uh, you know, everybody intuitively knows the moon. If there's anything to astrology, the moon must be important. It's a big bright light up in the sky. And it's true. And no astrologer would argue. But the single most obvious thing about the moon is that it goes through phases yeah. and and yet and yet you go to an astrology conference or gathering and and just get to know somebody oh where's your moon and they're going to say oh it's in gemini in the fourth house or it's in pisces in the ninth house or it's conjunct saturn but you don't usually hear somebody saying oh i have a waning gibbous moon you know <laughs> and and the juxtaposition of of those two observations intrigued me that that there's nothing more obvious than the faces of the moon and there's kind of nothing more obvious in astrological culture than astrologers ignoring the faces of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it made me wonder yeah absolutely and it's interesting cuz in my practice as i've started it was just an intuitive move so as i picked up your book and saw that hey wait this is something this is something to really dig into because what it feels like for me in astrology is when i sit down with someone to understand the phase that they are under i get to meet them where they are at and they're ready to receive yes yes so it becomes the the opening to this kind of conversation that we're going to have as we <laughs> fly around the rest of that chart correct uh-huh uh-huh uh -huh. And what do you, what phase were you born under? Do you know? And and what are you under yeah, now? I, I know it. I know it well. Uh, the 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 moon was about seventy seven degrees ahead of the sun, so it's a waxing crescent moon. Not not quite up to the half moon, but but a little bigger than that new moon phase. Brilliant. And where are you now? Um, right, well, right now I'm I'm just moving out of my uh, waning gibbous moon, uh, coming coming towards the the end of the moon cycle. Ho hopefully not the life cycle, despite the <laughs> gray hair. But it's, it's, it's a it's a 29 year cycle, so everybody lives a normal lifespan gets to go through it. You know, like may, maybe three times, two times, three times. You know. Yeah, so we get to have different phases within the phases, which I yeah, think... exactly. You're born with a phase, and then there's the progressed phase that, that you're in. And the juxtaposition of the two can be really interesting. Oh, yes. I think, you know, most people, if we, as we talk, we'll, we'll cover this. But if you look back and you even go just three years, 
and kind of look at who you've been for three years yeah. and then where yeah. you landed. It's like, yeah. well, what island is this? You know, yeah. <laughs> so uh-huh. a different, a different awakening that definitely happens. And so that's interesting. I was born, I am gibbous as well and i'm waxing waxing gibbous big big difference yes i mean i was born waxing gibbous and i am in the disseminating phase right now which makes complete sense i feel like i have the biggest mouth ever right now i talk to everybody (laughs) and and, uh, electronically enhanced going out to thousands of of homes right (laughs) yes and and it's funny because it is i was a radio dj for 10 years Yes. And I didn't necessarily, it was accidental. I didn't mean to be doing that. And uh, I landed there and it perfectly prepared me for what I do now and how to share this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, well, here we go. Music programs or talk shows or or both. Both. Yes. And there was, it's funny because I was a weather girl. I was a traffic girl. (laughs) So talking about (laughs) astrological weather is up my alley. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Brilliant. So should we jump in and talk about these different phases of the moon and, and, and what this looks like? Well, here's, here's a place to start. Okay. Years and years and years ago, long, long, I guess when you were probably a baby, I, I got uh, one of the early computers, you know, when they, they were they were not very good, but an astrological program that would allow you to do some research. And and so I, I divided up, I, was, I, I got curious about the phases of the moon, it was way back. And I, I divided up uh, the, the waxing moon people, like new moon to full moon, sure. to, from the, the waning moon people, just two, two categories. And, and just started, I had a big database of clients and friends and some famous people in there. And, and I, I, I just was kind of going through it one person at a time, who's waxing, who's waning. And I started to feel it. You know, I, got, mm. I, I, I didn't have the words for it, but I could feel it. And, and so I, I, this was so vivid for me. I, I stopped looking at whether they were waxing or waning. I would just bring up the name and guess, you know, click, 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 blink, blink, blink. And I was hitting 75%, you know, something like that just intuitively yeah. so it was like wow i mean astrology works you know anybody who studies it soon learns that but lots of times when you isolate a single factor you know it's a little harder to pull it out of the mix this was hitting me over the head like a sledgehammer this really powerful thing and i i, I had an idea it was a wrong idea but it was it was kind of like the beginning of a, of a right idea I, I had the idea that people born under the waxing moon were more extroverted and the waning moon more introverted. It's not quite true, but that was kind of what hit my head as I was was trying to figure out how I was knowing what I was looking at. And I I realized it wasn't really right. Then then it hit me, The, the word, the exact word, the people born under the waxing moon were more forward. Not exactly extroverted, but forward. And when I was writing the book of the moon, I had to try to find a way to make that idea clear because I, I know it can seem a little slippery. So here, here was the idea I came up with in the book. Somebody born under that waxing moon who is introverted, you know, an introverted person born under the waxing moon who says, uh, you know, I'm shy. You got a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> you know so that's introverted but forward you know sure. just more in your face put it out there whether they're shy or or otherwise and then of course the the waning moon would be the opposite you know a little more uh circumspect and then as i went a little deeper into this i realized and this is a really fundamental insight about working with the faces of the moon this is the distinction of the waxing versus the waning once again later we have to get into the distinction between the bright half of the moon cycle and the dark half and so you you wind up with like two halves and it creates four quadrants (laughs) and and, you know you can see (laughs) this stuff but but waxing versus waning when we think in really broad and general terms about the psychology of younger people like birth to 40s, 
versus the psychology of older people. First, clearly, tremendous diversity. You know, the, mm. the world is incredibly diverse as far as that goes. But, but the, the basic distinction is that, that the younger people tend to, there's a lot of future ahead of them. They tend to be a little more hope, energy, engagement, uh, and a tendency towards headstrong idiocy. <laughs> <laughs> because of inexperience, you know, and, and whereas the waning half of life, the second half of life, we think of people as more reflective, uh, uh, contemplative. We've had failures and they didn't kill us, you know, <laughs> and we survived we more forgiving and tolerant and humble and all those good things that come with the second half of life. But the shadow, just like the shadow of youth, headstrong idiocy, the way I get all the older people angry at me is I say a vulnerability to resignation, depression, despair, yeah. giving up, you know, and those qualities that we kind of see generally comparing young people to old people work out even more reliably when you look at waxing moon birth people versus waning moon birth people. Yeah. That is so fascinating. It's so it much really bigger. Is. And it works. It works like crazy, you know? Yeah, but I love, too, that you just described how you felt it. Because so much of the astrology I practice, I feel. Yeah, that, you got to. Yeah, it just feels into this chart that's coming alive here to begin to tell the story or to see where the story is going. So to be able to feel these waxing folks, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you don't get it in your heart that way. You know, you can lecture astrologers, but you'll never be a real astrologer. It's, it's got to be intuitive. You've got, you got to burn the midnight oil, learn the techniques. But ultimately, the, the alchemical cauldron is really more your heart than your head. Yeah, which I think is an important thing to point out really quickly, because astrology is a technical skill, and you do got to do it, learn it, learn how to do what you're doing. But there are many people like me anymore, especially I think in my generation who we, we came into astrology backwards, right? We came in on the intuition first and then yeah. learned the technique. And that is okay. You yeah. get in and on the island, however you get here, uh -huh. you're called uh -huh. to be here, be here and do the work. And I know, and I have worked with some people who have felt that feeling of it's more intuitive for me. So maybe I'm doing it wrong. And I'm like, no, oh my <laughs> gosh, own that. <laughs> Let's judge by the results. You know, that, that's, that's really the bottom line. Yeah, brilliant. All yeah. right, waxing and waning people. Well, I'm yeah. waxing, so we're going <laughs> to move forward here into these phases. Yeah. Now, as we look at just the phases in general, there are eight different ones, and I learned about it as the little plant you know, at, at the, uh, at the new moon phase, we're planting, it's dark. You plant this little seed of intention or this little plant and you, it says cucumber on the package and you hope it's going to sprout into a cucumber, you know, but it's dark. You're planting down there. There's no, <laughs> there's no assurances of what that's going to be. But in that beginning implantation stage, you're getting into the ground. So when we are experiencing this even just outside of the birth chart as we're experiencing it in the world and in a month and in a, the period of the cycle there's a lot of new not quite sure known energy that's happening but it is alive and it's moving yeah. right yes, yes. it's waiting to become what it's going to be uh -huh. next. Uh -huh. you gotta have faith at that time it's all you've got it's all you've got that's right because the package says cucumbers yeah. <laughs> we hope that it's going to be cucumbers in the end, right? I think it's also the faith at the new moon phase because we have to let go and not watch it. Yeah. You know, like I can't just stay here. You can't just watch a flower and make it grow. Yeah. Not and, you know, where the writing on the package says cucumber, the translation into the new moon phase, that writing, uh, you, you read it in your heart. Yeah. You know, it's an intuitive kind of thing. You know, if you don't, if you don't feel it, you, you just have no idea what direction you're going to go. Yeah. But, but what starts at the new moon, it's like, well, if you, if you plant cucumbers and then halfway through the season, you wish you'd planted tomatoes instead, 
enjoy your cucumbers. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so what we start at that new moon, for good or for ill, it has a kind of momentum. It's what you planted. And you know, I've seen people who, who tie themselves in knots with, I don't know what to plant. I don't know what to plant. And then for the next 30 years, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Yes. You know, because that's the seed they planted. You know? Absolutely. And that thing is going to germinate, you know, and it is going to it is, it's going to put the feelers down in there to begin to create something. So I love that you point that out. Good yeah. or ill, what's yeah. happening right there? It's, you're yeah. going to carry that for a bit. And you got to trust your heart. It's all you've got. I don't know, off the top of my head, have illustrations for all the phases, but I've got a great one for the new moon. Um, Bill Gates, Bill Gates, you know, the famous wealthy Bill Gates, you know, founder of Microsoft. So he's a young man. He's in his new moon phase by, by progression. And he's at Harvard, you know, so he's a young man with a very bright future, a student at Harvard. And so he's, you know, he's going to rule the world. And uh, he decides to drop out of Harvard and start a business in a garage with a friend of his business they called Microsoft. <laughs> and I, I mean, you know, we're both smiling because we understand that was a good career move for Bill Gates. Yeah. But, but imagine, I don't know any facts here, but I, I think I'm on pretty solid ground. Imagine what his parents thought Oh, He's dropping out of Harvard to start a business in a garage. Well, you know, he trusted his guts, trusted his heart. Here's, here's, a, here's one more story. Bad habit. It's a personal story, but it's a, it has the good grace of being slightly embarrassing. When I was in my own new moon, uh, I've been through a couple of them now, but I was like 21, 22, and I advertised myself publicly as an astrologer for the first time in my life, I would do readings, you know, for anybody who called this phone number, you know, now what, what obviously important seed moment of my life, but here's what makes the story kind of fun to tell where I decided to advertise myself publicly as an astrologer was the bulletin board of a girl's dormitory. <laughs> In Charlotte, North Carolina, a little <laughs> handwritten index card. I'll do free readings for a research project, you know. And I was new in this in this town, <laughs> Charlotte, and I I wanted to meet girls, you know, because I'm a 22 year old guy, and I did readings, did them honestly. Uh, I did get a girlfriend out of it. <laughs> and, uh, it didn't work out, but we're still friends, you know. Many like 50 years later, you know, we still communicate. <laughs> but you know, it, it was like. I, I love that story in a lot of ways. It, the serious takeaway with it is that um, at one level, I had no idea what I was doing, you know, uh, or I thought I did. I thought I was trying to meet girls through this, this sure. trip of, of doing readings. But actually, my higher self yep. knew what I was doing in a big way and just working kind of whimsically and intuitively and trusting those energies at that time, you know, set the wheels turning in a good way. At other times, it might not work so well, but then it really did, you know, Absolutely. and that's the key with the new moon. It worked for Bill Gates. Uh, it didn't make me quite as much money, but it worked really <laughs> well for me too. Absolutely, and I think about um, how my intuition was caught when I started Stormy Grace. I walked into this radio station that I had been at for a decade and I loved what I did. I loved it. I had no intention of leaving, yeah. nothing. And I walked through the doors and all I heard is that I was going to leave and I was going to never come back. I was going to start an astrology practice, which was nowhere on my radar at all. And my intuition said, just wait until this new moon. And from that new moon, I tell you what, what it looked like from that new moon all the way a year later yeah. was I was moving my feet. It was very slow. And I just gently trusted the small voice that I heard, but I'm also still human. So I was going, oh my God, I'm going to starve, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that whole year, the energy planted at that new moon, it moved as slowly as mm -hmm. I did. And it was a slow, long year. I want to just uh, really make that clear. Uh, uh, uh. But then once what I got from that 
was the understanding that I was guided to the phase that was going to help me do what I needed to do. I just needed to trust it. And then years after that, it's used much better. I use them much better. (laughs) Not like slow, long, purposeful, hard years if I don't have to have them. (laughs) I love it. It sounds sounds to me like like during the, uh, the waning crescent phase, like the moon is disappearing into the sun, it seems like you really nailed that because that's you know it's like the a vision is forming i'll be an astrologer what what does that mean exactly i'm not sure yet you know and and it's like when i see somebody in that waning crescent moon leading up to the new moon you know i I tell them things are going to fall away yeah some things might be taken from you if you're deep down inside, you realize, you know, the things that are taken, I'm done with them anyway, you know, letting them go isn't really so hard. I don't know why, maybe I'm crazy, you know, (laughs) know, you're not, you're not just release and, and recognize that the vision is forming. It's not formed, it's forming. And there, there's a difference. And, and so people get in trouble and, and just before that new moon, because they they will they'll, they'll understandably feel insecure like i don't know what i'm doing i should i should do something just do something <laughs> I need and, to do and, something yeah exactly and so they 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 go off kind of half baked <laughs> it's, it's it's better to be patient and do the spiritual work that's really what it is yes letting letting the vision crystallize you know letting it letting it form and then the light turns green and because of synchronicity you'll see the light turning green and and then and then you go forward as the as the new cycle starts yes i think that that is the thing that i am learning the most and working with my clients with is the spiritual life here is not optional right yeah. it is because i don't know whether you call it god you call it the universe whatever that thing is that we think each of us get the opportunity to connect with it wins every time yeah yes count on so <laughs> to really dig into this the spiritual work is is just a key so yeah. there's oh. a really really cute story about that the, the late great ram das you know you know who yes. died just a year ago wonderful amazing man I saw him years ago and in the middle of this talk where, you know, it's like a thousand people in an auditorium, in the middle of the talk, he sort of gets a little spaced out, like he's having one of those LSD flashbacks. <laughs> and, and, and then he, you know, he points and, and he says, see, see that exit sign? You know, the usual little mm-hmm. illuminated exit sign in every auditorium. He says, see that exit sign? We all turn around and look. He says, don't believe it. Oh, it was a terrific moment. It was what a teaching. It's like you're on the spiritual path. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there isn't a choice about it. You know? yeah. <laughs> Don't uh, believe the exit sign. You know? Yeah, you're not getting out without the work. So there's yeah, that. Exactly. Exactly. You can do it faster. You can do it slow. But you yeah. know, there it is. <laughs> All right. Should we move to this waxing crescent phase? Oh, okay. You want to go through them in order? Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's do it. Well, you know, if you uh, if you live out under really dark skies, mm. maybe maybe you see a crescent moon, like you know, the, just a little standard moon symbol, like on an outhouse door or something, and it's up in the sky, and and then if you look carefully, when I say dark sky, you'll you'll see the rest of the moon, you know, looking yeah. black. You know, just that little fingernail pairing of, of the light of yes. the moon. That's the phase we're talking about. As we move into that, from that phase up until the half is the mm-hmm. waxing crescent. And and so we see the moon, new moon, dark of the moon. You can't see anything. It's all inside of you. Waxing crescent moon, we start to see something. Yeah. But we don't. We ain't seen nothing yet, <laughs> is sort of the short version of it. Metaphor I love to use with my clients is uh, you're, you're at theater, you're going to watch a play, and, and the curtain is starting to come up, freeze frame. Curtain is six inches up, and here's all we know about this play. It, it's about people with shoes. <laughs> You know, it sounds silly, but that's what we know. Mm -hmm. Much is yet to be revealed, you know. So at that waxing crescent moon, 
uh, they're, they're in terms of progressions, you know, so the, the kind of phases that we go through. Uh, the thing we started at the new moon, you're starting to see some action. You're starting to see some results of it. Uh, J.K. Rowling, famous Harry Potter gal, you know, yeah. she's writing, writing the first Potter novel in her new moon. She's on welfare, a single mother, you know, no yeah. contract. She gets rejected 12 times, you know, mm. and then she moves into her waxing crescent phase and she sells the first Harry Potter book. I, I don't know how much money she got. I know something about publishing. I doubt she got $5,000, you know, nice check, but it's not going to feed you and the baby for very much longer, you know. Right. I'm sure her friends bought cheap champagne, you know. So there it was, J.K. Rowling's curtain up six inches, you know. The first Potter book is in print. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, I know in our... You have, have faith at the beginning. You need the faith at the beginning to jumpstart the process. You know, you said that. I want to repeat it. Yeah, because, I mean, as that thing, it's just like the motor, like your cucumbers are just getting a little strength here. You know, yeah, they're just yeah, starting yeah. to realize that they can survive and maybe actually do this thing. Maybe yeah. become it, the thing yeah, that it's exactly. going to be when it grows up. It's, exactly. it's an interesting phase. And it's an interesting phase if we pause and feel it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Cause it's like, okay, it's definitely going to be something. Yeah, it still takes faith. It takes <laughs> yeah. faith. But you start to have a little support for the faith. A yes. Yes. Oh, that's a brilliant way to say it. A little support for the faith. People oh. born under this phase, you know, will, uh, there's, well, I, I think, and you know, here I'm an old guy, obviously, but, but anybody looking at me can see I'm excited about this stuff. Yes. And, and, you know, this is the phase I was born into, the waxing crescent energy. And there's, uh, there's usually, no matter a person's age, uh, a kind of that, that energetic, forward, engaged, excited, tomorrow's going to be even cooler than today, you know, <laughs> that, that, that kind of feeling that goes with it. Now, that all sounds great, and it kind of is, but it, it can make a person uh, behave stupidly, you know, like, uh, mm. I, I feel lucky is sometimes the dumbest thing that's ever been said, you know, maybe <laughs> we're not as lucky as we think we are, you know, so there, every, all, everything I believe about astrology rests on that template that mm. every front has a back. There's everything, everything has a purpose, you can get it right, everything can be gotten wrong. There's nothing that's lucky or unlucky. I'm very different from most astrologers as far as that goes. They're quick to say good luck or bad luck or this is your sure. lucky year, et cetera. I never say that. It's, it's, always, it's always questions, you know, the answers we create ourselves. Yeah, the perpetual why. That's okay. Yeah, perpetual. <laughs> it's yeah. a good place to be. I think that's an okay. I personally think it's a great place to be. Yeah, <laughs> well, you're under a waxing phase too. Yeah. And I tell you what, I don't know what your experience is, but I feel like when I meet people who have a son in the ninth house, we are the wise. It's like, why? Well, but why? Yeah. Right? You know? People expect it of you. Yeah. <laughs> and that continues to show up. All right. Uh, we're in the first quarter now. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the first quarter. I think about my process where we're going. So yeah. we've Got the cucumbers in there. They figured out they can be something. And now at this first quarter, it's I feel like this is where it like starts to root down. Like we start to create a bit of an anchor mm -hmm. for, for the thing that has started to become something to really be able to go ahead and take some some root. It's like a beginning is happening yeah. here. A whole nother mini beginning is coming yeah. from the, the re-anchoring here. Yes, yeah, exactly. This is a... It's a, it's a good teaching moment in terms of the theoretical basis for understanding all this. Right at the beginning of the program, I, I said a lot about the waxing versus the waning distinction. And I mentioned briefly the, the bright versus dark distinction. We can have a bright hemisphere that, that is like the, the week before and the week after the full moon, and then mm -hmm. the dark one the week before and week after the new moon. Um, and it starts off with something very simple that at the at the new moon something is beginning but it is invisible sure. you can't see the new moon at the full moon it's as big and bright as it can be you can't get any rounder than round you know this is 
maximum manifestation. And, and so we have the idea of the subjective at the new moon and the objective mm. at the full moon, the unmanifest and the manifest, uh, the spiritual world and the material world, you know, sure. e even that. And, oh, right away, I mean, that gets into some big territory. There are spiritual people would think, oh, the material world, you wouldn't want to be there, would you? You know, that, <laughs> that very negative attitude towards the flesh. And then, of course, there's materialists who, you know, laugh at everything spiritual. Sure. And, 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 you know, it's like you need these two halves, you know. But the, the bright phases of the moon, starting with what we're talking about here, is, is about the die is cast, you know, we're in the world. In a sense, the baby is born, not embryonic anymore, but good luck, you know, here you are <laughs> launched in the world. And so the thing that began invisibly, now we start to see it and it starts to attract attention. Yeah. And it starts to be integrated into society. Now, here's what happens. Um, again, a, a, bit, a bit of theory to under, understand this. When I was writing the book of the moon, I hooked the phases of the moon to the cycle of the year, the solstices and the equinoxes. Uh, and it was really very obvious, the longest, darkest night of the year, the winter solstice, the dark of the moon, the new moon. It was, it was just clear as a bell. And each of the phases just fell into place but the, this would make um, the waxing crescent moon, the first quarter moon, the vernal equinox, it would start with the first day of spring, Aries energy ruled by Mars, the god of war. As soon as your vision starts to actually take up some space in this world and say, I want the resources, I want some attention, I'm going to win this one. Yeah, any, here to any questions you know well, there, <laughs> there, there are questions you know and so we start to meet resistances you know we we we, we encounter uh, uh the word enemies has some relevance sometimes it's, it's very straightforward rivals competition mm -hmm. is pretty fundamental to the the nature of embodied existence we we don't yeah. have to be bloody minded about it but you know there it is, you know. Uh, you know, I, I want the Stormy Grace Astrology Show to do a lot better than somebody whose name I won't mention, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I bet you would agree with me. <laughs> you know, and that that's that's first quarter moon stuff. And so you have to the grace with this, the wisdom path with it, is you gotta fight. You gotta fight to be free, but you gotta choose your battles. You know, yeah. anyone who's ever won a war, forgive all these military images, but anyone who's ever won a war will tell you sometimes to win the war, you have to know which battles to lose and which battles not to fight, you know. Yeah. So yeah. what of your vision is really worth fighting for and making a stand for? And where are you just setting yourself up to go down in glorious flames, you know? You're going to deal with questions of human competition if you're born in that first quarter moon, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and because it's such a um, a growth time, I think what I was thinking into is the, the questions and the different ideas you were saying that kind of pop up, you know, like these other little things come up. And of course, that brings challenge to the table anyways. And it's like, oh. Uh, well, challenge and challengers. Yeah. And, you know, how do you grow? <laughs> Got to have a little challenge, it turns out. Exactly. So we're definitely doing that right here at this phase yes. so if you can feel into that as they start to pop up or maybe even a little different avenue presents itself it's like that's okay that's all right but is it the right one be with yeah. that for a minute yeah there you yeah. go yeah that's exciting yay yeah. i know i'm all, i'm feeling all into this now, Stephen. <laughs> now, now, now we get to go to the most exciting phase of all right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> the waxing gibbous yeah. yeah what a phase what you know, you say waxing gibbous and it sounds dull until you get into it you know right so right, this, this one is it's obviously your phase and i hope i don't <laughs> embarrass you too much here you know so mm -hmm. in, in the the old uh you know, my, my, my bloodline, the Celtic people, uh, they're in their holidays. This is May Day. Yeah. And okay. uh, it, it was uh, Beltane was the, the old name for it. And, and Beltane, married couples would forget their marriage vows. This, this was the custom. 
and there would be this gigantic wild orgy people fornicating in the fields you know one night and all you know all sins are, are forgiven you know, for that <laughs> one night it was quite a party and and you know of course everybody laughs when i i say that it's it's a, it's fun to think about for obvious human reasons but it was it was not simply an orgy and here's here's where this gets serious mm -hmm. that they were practicing sympathetic magic fornicating in the fields literally to give the plants the idea to give the animals the idea mm -hmm. this was a celebration of sex but sex in the way people used to think about it where it was inseparable from fertility sure you know, where it meant babies you know and so it's a festival of fertility as much as sex now now the the lovers kinds of i won't embarrass you here but lovers kinds of themes often are, are they're important for everybody but very dynamic central spiritual questions for people born under this phase that's true but it's so much more than that so mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this is almost funny to say because it's obviously what I'm about to say, the story of your life, where two people in conversation get excited and you say things and I'm excited. I, I, I try to be polite, not interrupt you. And you get excited, you try to be polite. We're doing great so far. And, and that's, that's cross-fertilization intellectually, mentally. It's not sex, obviously, in the narrow sense, but in some broader symbolic sense, it's the fertility that happens when people come together. Like we, we sometimes will say, if you want to make sure nothing ever gets done, give it to a committee, ho, 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 you know? <laughs> but, and, 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 you know, sometimes that's sadly true. But other times a committee makes things better, you know? Mm. Like I've learned uh, as a writer that having a good editor is more precious than gold, you know, because that editor will see things that I don't see and how I might improve something or make it better. So two people together or, or 200 people together, working together, sharing their energies. And so your life is, uh, I, I, your personal life, we, we, we don't necessarily need to put that on YouTube. And I don't know <laughs> anything about it, although I have seen your chart, but, <laughs> yeah. but you know, your professional life, clearly is is dependent upon sharing your energy with other people and and the synthesis that comes from the shared energy and so that's that waxing gibbous moon it's actually very exciting it's very exciting and i have to tell you you know so in when i was younger my family was catholic and, and they still are and i'm just a really bad version of that but uh the way that it has come for me, um, spirituality and that connection, is that I decided to date my higher power. Ooh. Because it was the only way that I could breathe it in enough to actualize it in, in my world and in the work that I see. And so that has been my constant companion is that I, I, I date this power greater than me. That's that's eloquent. That's eloquent. The, the, the word you know, dating is, is it's a, a, a sort of polite, socially acceptable reference to romantic and sexual interaction. And uh, it's so critical in understanding this phase that that we are unabashedly enthusiastic about sex, you know, no, yeah. no, oh, yeah. no, no shame, no shame. But at the same time, we, we like the book of the moon, one of, one of the kind of memes that runs through the book of the moon is how our culture is constantly oscillating between Puritanism mm -hmm. and pornography. Yeah. And, and they couldn't exist without each other. They're an interdependent whole. If it weren't for if it weren't for puritanism and sexual shame, pornography would just seem like a joke. You know, naked yeah. people like everybody's naked. <laughs> you know, what's the big deal? You know, and and sex. You know, it is it would be you know commonly available, not this uh, illicit uh, drug. You know that we can mm -hmm. maybe afford and all. It, it's. Puritanism and pornography, they love each other. They couldn't exist without each other. And the reason I'm saying all this, it's fun to say it, but also just to get past that, yeah. pierce the veil of that silliness 
is, is the way that we really get to the heart of the face of the moon you were born under. So dating your higher power is an eloquent way of saying it. <laughs> Yeah. And it's funny because sometimes we have to go back um, in our dating life together to just coffee. So, <laughs> you know what? I don't it's trust you with out. that. <laughs> We're going to just go to coffee for a minute. So it's a, it's a really it bring us to the full moon. <laughs> yeah, the full moon right here. It's big. It's bright. We've got all the light super round. You see the things that you didn't even see that were there. It's yeah it's you're alive you're awake it's open progress has been made you yeah. know it's all on the table it is on the table yeah Even here's my you, life i say to my clients progress full moon if you want to know your karma look at your life you know yeah. there it is you know it is expressed yeah. it's maximally out there it's materialized materialized the material world is is the playground of the soul you know mm -hmm. we just put the stuff out there. The great Tibetan saint, uh, Padma Sambhava, uh, once said, if you want to know your previous lifetimes, consider your present circumstances. Mm. It's just the essence of the principle of karma. And uh, if you, uh, and we, it works very literally here, if you want to know your previous lifetimes, as well as what is previous in sure. this lifetime, look at your conditions under the full moon, your relationships, your work, your health, your body, you know, the works, you have put it on the table. There it is, uh, mm. warts and all, you know? Warts and all. So at this point, you've either got a cucumber or you don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and if you wish you'd planted tomatoes, <laughs> once again, enjoy those cucumbers. And just enjoy those cucumbers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. In the, in the book of the moon, it gave each of these faces a name. And this one, the, the full moon, I just called it the human being, you know, because we, we are just completely human. You know, here I am. My favorite little story there, there's a, a guy, a client of mine, and he was kind of self-deprecating humor. He was talking about, he's, he's driving down the road. He's got a van. He's taking his like three children back from rainbow soccer practice or something. And he's, he's driving down the road in this van, his suburban neighborhood. He sees this beautiful girl, you know, on the street. He's checking her out, you know, and she notices him. And, and then he realizes what he looks like, you know, a <laughs> soccer dad in a van with three kids. And he just smiles at her and shakes his head. She smiles back and he drives on that. I mean, there it is, you know. Yeah. He, he, was, he was not unhappy, but, you know, this is it. This is my life. Deal with it. Accept it. It's not going to be some magical tomorrow. This is the fullness of time. My cucumbers. <laughs> My cucumbers. That's so brilliant, though, to have just that moment to go, well, hold on. What does this actually look like? What's the reality yeah. in yeah. this moment? Exactly. <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay, so we're moving into the disseminating phase or the, the, the waning gibbous. Yeah, waning gibbous disseminating phase that uh, Dame Ruger uh, called it that. You know, when I started writing the Book of the Moon, I, I, uh, my, my nature, Mars and Aquarius conjunct, Mercury, third house cost by. I'm always inclined to tear up all the traditions and start over again. You know? <laughs> and, and and just sometimes the traditions are often helpful, but I want to I want to test everything. And and so I I, I started out thinking there's got to be twelve phases to the moon because twelve. I mean, give me a break. You know that's astrology. And I, I just couldn't make it work in a way that was plausible. I could force it. I I could. I, I could obfuscate, but I knew it just wasn't singing to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I went back to Rudyard with his idea of the of the eight faces. Yes. It seemed a little counterintuitive. Um, I, 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 his work is excellent, and I used it, and it's incorporated in the Book of the Moon. Uh, I don't agree with all of it. You know, I see the world a lot sure, differently sure. Than, than Dan Rudyard did, which I, I say with nothing but respect for him. Uh, so I've rewritten a lot of the stuff and see some of the faces ra rather differently. Uh, but the disseminating phase, this uh, waning gibbous phase, here's my take on it. It's not terribly far from Rudyard. It's like we're, we're giving something up, you know, we're the seeds out into the universe. And yeah, he's, he's, he's accurate about that, totally right about that. But here's my understanding. Okay. So we, this is of the bright phases 
of the phases that have to do with manifestation that are centered around the full moon, mm -hmm. this is the last one. Because the next phase is going to be that last quarter phase. The moon is getting to be less than half, heading back down into the dark, that entering that fourth quadrant, which is mystical and fascinating, going to be fun to talk about. But this is the last phase before we are heading back, let's say, into, into dissolution, into, mm -hmm. metaphorically, into death. I mean, yeah. loud and clear doesn't mean when you come to the last phase of the moon, you're going to die. I just, out of mercy for any of your listeners here who are just beginning, I, I want to make that totally clear. Sure. But uh, thinking about death for a moment, here's the spirit of, of this waning gibbous moon. I think of uh, sort of a middle-class American ritual of writing your will. Mm -hmm. Now, many times we write a will, we're healthy, you know, we're, we're, we ain't dead yet, you know, we're still writing our will. Now, it's about losing everything you have, you know, that's what wills are about. Everything you possess, every penny, every object, you know, gone. If you came home at the end of the day and there'd been a home invasion and your house has been stripped bare, there's nothing left in it, um, you're going to feel sorry for yourself. You know, you're going to have the blues because of that. You've just lost everything. Sure. But weirdly, writing a will is sort of joyful. See, there's the key. Because we're thinking of people we love. And oh, I'll give little Susie $50,000. I don't think how happy that will make her. I hope it makes her happy. But, you know, yeah. and, and the piano that I inherited from my grandparents, you know, who's going to get that? And, and the, the, this giveaway feeling mm -hmm. is joyful. And, and that is so much the, the high heart of that disseminating moon or winning gibbous moon that we're giving things away we're dealing we're we're still in the bright half of the cycle so we're still engaged with people engaged with society but we're about to leave we're going to leave all that behind so we're still engaged but goodbye oh by the way here are things i won't be needing anymore and so we give them now something i've found quite commonly this my, my my sample of friends and clients, of course, is not, not a random sample of humanity. They're self-selected people interested in astrology. Uh, it's important to say that. But a pattern I, I saw when I was researching all this is how many psychotherapists, for example, or closely parallel people into healing and shamanism and stuff like that, psychotherapy being one illustration, we're born under this phase of the moon, the sense of deep engagement with other people's transformations, as if we're giving something of our wisdom to others and living in a sense for others. And, and that, uh, see, waning gibbous moon doesn't sound too exciting, so I labeled it the shaman, and then everybody got excited about it. But it's actually That's pretty way better. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. But it also really rings true. It's the spirit of it. You know, every, I'm in California. So every, every third neurotic out here thinks they're a shaman. Yeah. It's, it's a sort of a plague out here. Uh, and, and they often don't understand shamanism. And a shaman in a traditional culture is a healer, of course. But typically, he or she will make an enormous personal sacrifice in order to be the shaman. Many times they do not live very long. You know, the energetic work of descending into the underworld and all that, it takes a bite out of a person. They're, they're, uh, make of this what you will, but wrestling with demons, you know, yeah. some of those demons, whatever that might mean to us, are powerful and smart and uh, don't want to lose, you know. Yeah. So shamans, uh, shamans pay a price. And why would anybody do that? Just out of love, out of love, you know. Yeah, out of the need yeah. to give back. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Notice how, how since we got to the full moon, compared to the first four phases, remember we're older people, things a little bit more subtle, 
you feel the complexity of these ideas compared to the more straightforward ideas of, of, the, of the first four phases. Sure. That's the tonality of it. Yeah. And I, en- I enjoy feeling into it in the progressed energy as well, since this is definitely where I'm at. And yeah. I'm feeling that sense of giving back because it was given to me. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so you've got it. Whether it's your progressed phase or this is where you were born under it, or this is just what you're experiencing in, in your monthly calendars, this is a place where you are going to get that cucumber now and give it to somebody so that they can eat. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, oh, can get all wrapped in that, right? Yeah. This is, it's a good phase. <laughs> They're yeah. all good phases. But... Very exciting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's last quarter, I guess we're out to Yeah. Gosh, we're at the last quarter. So yeah. this third quarter, last quarter phase. Yeah. It's interesting because we've done it. We've picked the cucumber. We've given it for people to eat. Um, and now we got to plow and till and get ready for something else. Yeah. Right? yeah it, that's it, right. The last two phases are very much like that. Yeah, it's that, that analogy with getting old, you know, like oh, how, yeah. how life feels when you turn 65, let's say. And, and there's a lot of answers to that. You know, some sure. people feel great. Some people feel depressed about it. But, but there's, there is the sense of much of life is behind you now. Sure. And uh, there's hopefully life ahead too. But, but you know, that, that sense you're clearly past the middle of it, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, when a 12-year-old says, when I grow up, you know, we all listen. When a 65-year-old says, when I grow up, we hope they're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, a, this is a prime opportunity to express gratitude and have a, a reflection. You just grew cucumbers. Yeah. Right? Like that's or you got to participate in the process of that happening. And now if you want those tomatoes, you can yeah. get ready for that. Yes. There's, I feel like this phase comes with um, just a sense of reverence around it, that things have to yeah. have to go before the others can come. You know, exactly. they, I was always taught um, that you can't, uh, you can't ask for the next blessings unless you're willing to make some space for them to be there. Yeah. And this is what I feel like happens at this particular phase. Exactly. Mm-hmm. This is the autumnal equinox, you know, opposite the vernal yeah. equinox. And, and, and so we're heading into the cold, dark months of the year, and uh, literally much of nature is, is dying back into itself. It will be reborn, of course, but, you know, that end of the cycle stuff. The story I, I tell, I use this in, in the Book of the Moon. I, I picture a, 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 a man and a woman who meet at a party. Mm-hmm. Big crowded room. They see each other across the room. They they hear the violins. You know their their eyes meet and and uh, after a while they find themselves alone together, maybe out on the balcony. You know, and they introduce themselves, but they've been feeling this this vibe and and the, the attraction is just palpable. And mm-hmm. six weeks later, they're married. <laughs> Let's say, and it's actually a good story, not a bad one. Yeah. They, you know, they've found each other. And now I just add, uh, he's 82 and has survived a heart transplant. And she's 78 and she's a cancer survivor. Yeah. And now they are together. And each moment is absolutely precious. Yeah. And he commits some infraction against the household. He forgets to do the dishes or he leaves little whiskers in the sink or, you know, or she, she does some female version of the same <laughs> stuff and, and they forgive each other. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're not going to tussle about stuff like that the way yeah. younger people will because death is looming for both of them. Each moment together is precious. Yeah. And that, that richness and that, poignant feeling you you can be born under this last quarter moon and you can be 17 years old and you'll know what i'm talking about when i talk like that we don't have to be that old it's just the the metaphor of the age gives us the tone 
of this. I, I would also add that here's a, a powerful but dangerous word, maybe the heaviest one in the English language, forgiveness. Mm. Forgiveness, you know, which is a, obviously a very beautiful word, but forgiveness at the risk of sounding a little cynical, I, I think 90% of what flies under the banner of forgiveness is rationalization and compartmentalization because yeah. forgiveness is the end of a long, complicated process. I, 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 my feeling is nobody should ever strive to be more forgiving, even though that sounds so virtuous. I think it's better to think of forgiveness as a grace that comes at the end of a long and very honest and very funky process. Yeah. And so putting the word forgiveness on the table, but honoring its complexity that we're really done with something and we have genuinely let it go. We're not trying to be virtuous. We're just not bothered by it anymore. God bless you. I let it go. I know you mm -hmm. were doing your best, you know. Yeah. That, these processes of forgiveness tend to arise rather naturally as a grace in the last quarter moon phase. And it's part of the way we prepare ourselves to descend into the mysteries of the new beginning. You know, we have to be done with the past. We can't keep getting on with the past. And forgiveness is, is kind of the flowering of, of that, that process. Absolutely. And I tend to find that the universe is kind and to help facilitate the process of um, the wisdom of forgiveness, people yeah. show up and we are able to help them or hear them or, yeah. and, and it's, it's almost as if we speak forgiveness back to ourselves through helping another person, you know, yeah. like yeah. that is yeah. a continued experience of, especially mm -hmm. people like you said, cause they can be very young and they just say back to you what you said to them. And it's like, how did that, that yeah. is okay. yeah. so uh -huh. nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of wash our hands of the attachments and, yeah. and it's just left with nothing but love yeah. on conditional positive regard. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. And then we, we wrap, wrap it up. We move to this, this, yeah. this waning crescent phase of the balsamic phase. Some people will say it that way. Yeah. And it's time to, it's time to really let go, bring it to completion, gently begin to, to disengage with what was and get set for the, the plans moving forward. But the yeah. plans moving forward, I think, start to come from the place that I can't show anyone. I can yeah. only explain it in the best words that I've got available, yeah. right? Uh -huh. But it, it comes mm -hmm. through the, the lens of transition here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a spiritual process, you know, so it's a mystery. Yeah. Oh, mystery fruit, friends. Yeah. Have mystery. The, the light bulb lighting over somebody's head, though. You know, that's mm -hmm. everybody knows that iconography from cartoons. You know, we get the idea. Everybody's had the experience of the light bulb lighting over their head. And how do we explain it? You know, what is it? Where does inspiration come from? You know, we didn't have the idea, then we did. You know, that that's a that's a classic. A uh, waning crescent moon experience. Dan Ridger called it the balsamic moon, like balsam, the incense disappearing up into the nostrils yeah. of the gods or into the atmosphere. Um, and as, as our personality, our whole way of being unravels and mm -hmm. is released, uh, uh, some people I could say your personality, personality unravels, they'd be horrified, and others who would think it's like taking off tight shoes, you know, <laughs> taking off the tight shoes is, is really the right attitude here. Um, this is um, the analogy of the faces of the moon with the life cycle would place this at, at the end of life. And so uh, to get the high side of this across, I, I always like to imagine a uh, a woman, I'll make her 96 years old, or make her a woman, could be a man just as easily. And she's going to illustrate the high end of it. Now here, we, we get a little weird, but you can handle that. I've seen yeah. you, you know? <laughs> and, and so she, she was happily married, let's say, making up a story, happily married for 47 years to a soulmate who passed away 17 years ago. And she misses him, 
understandably. So far she could say that in polite society, everybody would say, oh, we're so sorry for your loss. Mm -hmm. but here's where it gets weird. Sometimes when she's alone at home, she hears his voice. And I, I don't mean she remembers his voice. Mm -hmm. I mean she hears his voice. And sometimes she answers him. Now she knows enough about this world to know she shouldn't tell anybody that or they're going to give her pills for it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now, sometimes when she answers him, he's been known to answer her. This wise woman, 96 years old, has had conversations with her dead husband. Mm -hmm. And she knows that if anybody were sitting in the same house with her when that was happening, they wouldn't have heard anything except crazy old dingbat talking to herself, yeah. you know? But she knows better than that because she misses him and because most of the people she has loved in her life have already gone through that doorway that mm -hmm. we call death. She's kind of looking forward to going through it herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, she knows once again, this is so, so waning crescent moon, this next line. Once again, she knows that if she said that last line to people, if she said, I want to die. Yeah. Everybody would again offer her pills for that. You know, they would call it clinical depression. Yes. It isn't. It's spiritual faith. I almost said the F word right there on the air, you know. <laughs> I'll just leave it to it's spiritual faith that she is hungry to pass through that door. Yeah. And will the circle be unbroken? And will she be rejoined with those souls with whom she experienced this incarnation and probably many others? And and so the veil between the worlds has grown thin for her. Mm -hmm. So we find a lot of mystics born under this waning crescent moon. A lot of people into woo-woo stuff, you know. I don't, it, this is, it's funny getting older because the iconography of my youth doesn't mean much to younger people. So I'm going to, here's her reference. I don't know if anybody even know what it means. You, you tell me if you know what it means. The Twilight Zone? Yeah. I was you a Twilight Zoner. Oh, hey, yes. cool. You know, gradually, you know, <laughs> all this stuff goes poof. You know, it's just just cultural <laughs> evanescence. But, but Twilight Zone, Rod Serling, you know, do, 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 you know, and born under that waning crescent moon. You know, he's just the fine illustration of the the kind of woo woo spooky side of it. The veil between the worlds growing thin. Now, here I have the person himself or herself kind of sensitive to the larger framework of consciousness mm -hmm. and cosmos. And that ties in with something we've already said about this, the light bulb lighting over yeah. there. Well, that, you know, that veil is permeable. The light can go both directions. We can see him through it, but what's out there can also kind of enter mm -hmm. us. And, and so it's an important time to be quiet, patient, cultivate your spiritual life and without making any effort a new vision will mm -hmm. crystallize in your consciousness and then with that done well you come to the new moon and you start to act on that vision and you decide uh i'm gonna quit harvard and start a business in a garage, in and a see garage. How it works. <laughs> yeah this place where we come to the understanding gently willingly that it just can't be what it was anymore yeah, and it's exactly. interesting because when i see clients who this is the progressed phase they move into typically what it looks like is they have this quiet yearning for something else and yeah. people outside of them are saying why are you changing don't change stay the same so if that if you've been experiencing that you definitely want to check out your moon phase and see where you are because it comes with sometimes some very external indicators of what phase you're in as well and it doesn't if you know what what phase you're in those won't phase your phase you know? <laughs> well right? Said. Yeah. right because yeah. You're like, I, I got to change. I got to move on. And typically, I don't even think that it's that the, the people who don't want us to change don't want us to change. We just meet their fear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They feel insecure because we're not what we always said we would be, you know? Yeah. 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 Turns out never, we're not. Never say never, you know? <laughs> <laughs> not if you're going to stay alive as a human and experience yeah. this. Uh-huh. Even stay alive as a monkey. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Stephen, we covered all of the phases. Yeah, we've covered all the all eight phases. Wonderful. Man, and it's exciting. And it is exciting to even see how when, when we do discuss it, that the energy changes and even just conversation about it. Yes, so absolutely. You know, you guys out there, you know, I would love to hear, put the comments below this video for sure. What are your experiences with feeling through the moon, nurturing through your moon phases of, of wherever you were born, whatever phase, where your progress phase is, even just in the monthly cycle, you know, how are you feeling through and experiencing these? Cause we, I don't know. I just love to hear how people experience this different stuff. It's kind of a magical little dance, I think. Uh -huh. It is. Yeah, Stephen. And we're all invited. <laughs> I know, and some of us, I think, are required to attend, which is real yeah, fun, they, right? <laughs> all of us, in fact. <laughs> well, Stephen, thank you so much for coming and making time for us. You're very welcome, Stormy. This has been fun. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Okay, you guys, like the video, comment, share, subscribe. Of course, questions down below. Underneath this video will be Stephen's bio, any links to check him out, his work. You've got an apprentice program, which is mm -hmm. phenomenal. And, and one of our favorite visitors who comes over to the Eat and Greets is Brian Coulter. Oh, Brian. And, yeah. <laughs> and he'll actually be back. And we have done several things together and just people love it. So, and actually, He's wonderful. Yeah. he is phenomenal and so you guys and actually brian will be back here on the 16th as well so all of the information to check out stephen's work the books all of the good knowledge that's available will be under the video as well and we'll see you guys next time bye everybody thank you everybody